right. Good morning. I'm delighted to be here, and I want to thank um, the Cohen Foundation for all the support that they've given to our lab um, and to, to all the great researchers here as well. Um, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about something that's sort of been flying under the radar. We haven't uh, spoken, of, I haven't talked about this much at all, but um, it's something that's of interest to, to both basic and translational science. And this is the idea of the uh, viable but non-cultivable bacterial state of, of Borrelia burgdorferi and what I think it means. <clears throat> so not only uh, does the VBNC state have basic science uh, <laughs> indications, but also, uh, you know, with respect to the idea of persistence of infection. I, I think it's a very important to understand these bacteria. <clears throat> and this is the indica <laughs> indication of the, the, the Lyme problem, the, the reality of it. So um, the VBNC, or viable but non-cultivable, non-culturable state, is not unique to Borrelia. There, there are a lot of uh, aspects of Borrelia that, that we like to think are special, but um, bacteria do this very commonly. In fact, there are over 100 other bacterial species that enter into this viable but non-cultivable state. And of those, 51 are known human pathogens. So entering dormancy of this type is likely very common. Uh, the two characteristics that define a, a VBNC pathogen are, or bacteria are that they're viable and that they can't be cultured uh, with the standard culture media. So something drives, the stressor drives them into that that viable but non-cultivable state. <clears throat> so we know that they're metabolically active and they're viable, and with the right conditions, they can be resuscitated. At least some have been resuscitated. Um, so this has also been associated with morphological changes. A lot of bacteria that are rod-shaped will turn into cocci when they enter the VBNC state. And I think it's the, the bacteria try to increase their surface-to-volume ratio to, to preserve energy. And so the VBNC state of Borrelia and persisters, I think, can be used interchangeably. They're, they're basically the same thing as persister cells. So uh, again, there's, there's a great deal of precedence in other species. Uh, there's a broad uh, phylogenetic distribution in terms of the types of bacteria that enter the VBNC state. Most of them, a lot of the, the data that we have has come from the, the Vibrios, Vibrio cholera, Vibrio vulnificus, a lot of environmental pathogens, um, things that uh, enter the VBNC state at different temperatures or different uh, pH stressors. And if you're interested, this, uh, this review article is, is really, really great, uh, talking about this issue. So, what about the VBNC state with Borrelia? Well, this has been observed in mice and primates post-antibiotic treatment. So I feel like I want to dance. <laughs> All of a sudden. <laughs> so, <laughs> so basically, you know, once, once the animals have been treated, the infected animals have been treated with antibiotic, then you try to grow the, the bacteria from them in the, using standard culture techniques, and it doesn't work. Um, but we know that they're still viable. And so um, in this paper, the Hodzik paper, they, uh, they tested the, the pathogen, the spirochete loads after antibiotic treatment at different time points, and at eight months they were still very low, but at 12 months after treatment, the levels of bacteria had risen to the same level as the untreated, indicating that the mouse itself served as a, 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 a medium for the bacteria to resuscitate. And in our own studies in, in non-human primates, we found that um, those bacteria that persist, the Borrelia that persist, are transcriptionally active, and they're viable and intact. So, um, we know with, with humans and non-human primates 
that um, we have a limited ability to culture from them anyway. So I think that after prolonged infection of primates in host adaptation, that they may enter this VBNC state um, naturally as, a dead end ho as primates are probably a dead end host. And so it becomes more difficult to, to reculture them, whether they've been treated with antibiotics or not. So why would we embark on the study of culturing um, these VBNC Borrelia? Well, first from the perspective of basic science. Um, these, these are a very unique genera of bacteria, the Borrelia, the spirochetes. Um, we want to try to understand what stress conditions induce the VBNC state. In our case, it's exclusively uh, treatment with antibiotics. Uh, we want to understand what the phenotype of these bacteria are and what their gene expression profiles look like, um, and also under what conditions will re regrowth occur or resuscitation occur. There's also the medical controversy aspect. Um, the persistent studies in animals have been dismissed by some because of the inability to culture these bacteria from antibiotic-treated animals. And in this, um, this critical review here um, by, by Dr. Wormser, he says that although the concept of viable but non-cultivable is clearly controversial, which I'm not sure that it is, the fact that no cultivable cells remain after antibiotic therapy has been confirmed, and he, he, his group did this study. And so it has been proposed that the inability to culture is synonymous with a, a loss of infectivity. And I don't think there's any evidence uh, to confirm or negate that. Which is something else that we're working on. So the overall goal of this project was to resuscitate these, these viable but non-cultivable Borrelia from uh, antibiotic-treated animals. So what we did was, uh, the first thing we started with in vitro. So we treated the, the Borrelia with doxycycline in a culture dish, and then we tried different um, tactics to, to regrow them. And then uh, the second aim was to take the spirochetes out of animals and try to regrow them. So uh, this is the design. Uh, we, we had five different um, strategies that we were using. And this is based on data from other bacterial species. Uh, the first is the use of cell-free or spent condition media from uh, Borrelia culture. The second is to co-culture them with other feeder cells, eukaryotic feeder cells, um, co-culture them with tick cells or tick saliva combinations using combinations of spent media, and co-culture, and uh, as a final last resort, growth in dialysis membrane chambers within, within rats, which is a technique that's used somewhat routinely uh, for Borrelia culture and host adaptation. Um, subsequently, we added carbohydrate sources to the media. So what, what's the rationale for this? So uh, like Campylobacter has been known to be resuscitated by the use of intestinal feeder cells. And so we used human dermal fibroblasts and mouse fibroblasts thinking that the Borrelia grow real nicely in the skin. Um, and we also used uh, tick cells because to mimic the tick environment to see if we could get um, to spur growth. And unfortunately, um, we did not see any improvement in growth after using these, these feeder cell environments. We, we did learn that uh, Borrelia absolutely required BSK, so if you tried to use the culture media from the fibroblast cells, it didn't, <laughs> they didn't grow. Um, and the tick cells similarly did not produce regrowth. And spent media, this is conditioned media. And the rationale behind this is that when bacteria grow into the stationary phase, they start to produce these factors. Um, one is called resuscitation promotion factor, and it's like a cytokine for bacteria. Also autoinducers that um, help to promote the growth of uh, viable but non-cultivable cells. And actually, you can take the uh, condition and place it on a VBNC state, other bacterial species, and, and it will spur regrowth. So this is why we use uh, spent media. 
And you can imagine that when you do this, it's extremely important that you get rid of all the Borrelia, because if you put it in your media, you'll, you'll uh, <laughs> destroy your experiment if they all grow. So we, we've, we came up with a technique to produce that media that involved a, a very a hard centrifugation and filtration through a, uh, through a 0.1 micron filter. And for the in vitro studies, we did not see a benefit by adding this uh, spent media. However, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, when it comes to our animal studies. And so we tested a slew of different combinations of media to try to see if we could uh, regrow. And rich culture media is something that's almost universally used to resuscitate viable but non-cultivable cells. And so uh, when Borrelia is stressed, it switches its metabolism from, uh, from um, glucose to glycerol. And so we thought under the stress conditions, we might be able to resuscitate by adding glycerol. And we tried that on its own. It didn't work. Um, and then we added mannose, maltose, and, and acetylglucosamine because those are known um, carbohydrate sources that Borrelia can utilize. And then we also tested chytobios, which is a dimer of um, diacetylglucosamine. And because this is present in, ticks, in ticks, uh, tick environments. And uh, what we found was that the growth in the presence of the carbohydrate mix and the chytobios was basically equivalent. And it turns out that chytobios is quite expensive and also hard to get. So um, we, going forward, we just, we just stuck with our carbohydrate mix. Um, where did this guy come from? Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so we did, we came up with a couple of good, um, a couple of good options using the in vitro studies, using this, the addition of a carbohydrate mix. Incidentally, we also added auger to, to our cultures, just a, like a 0.1% because it's a source of carbohydrate and also viscosity, which Borrelia like. So, so going back to the, the morphological changes that occur uh, when entering the viable but non-cultivable state, we took a look at this um, staining of bacteria treated with, of Borrelia treated with doxycycline, and this is called a backlight stain. And so the green stain will stain all the bacterial cells, and the red um, is a propidium iodide, which will penetrate damaged cell membranes. So if you look here at the doxycycline treated, it looks like some of them are half dead, right? So we have some green here and some red here, green, red in the middle. And I think that instead of them being half dead, that this may be um, indicative of morphological restructuring that can occur with the stress. So changes in the membrane. <clears throat> so we also tested um, the antibiotic doxycycline treated Borrelia in rats, in the uh, rat culture system and also in mice. And so for the rats, what we do is we implant a dialysis bag filled with the, um, the treated Borrelia and see if they will grow. And we grew them for 21 days, and I think this was too long, so it didn't really, it didn't really work because our, um, our uh, controls also were, were uh, attenuated. They didn't grow very, or they were, they were overgrown, and so they stopped uh, replicating. Um, so. Forget about that. Um, and then in mice, we've done this a number of times where we treat with uh, doxycycline and inject into mice to see if they'll, they'll um, infect and spread. And we've, we've had some mixed results. Uh, but I think in general, um, there's indication that they, they do disseminate, but they're not necessarily actively dividing in the immunocompetent mice. So let's get to the fun part. <laughs> this is where it really counts. So this is the um, design of our AIM-2, of our animal studies. So we injected mice with um, Borrelia, and then we waited two months, and then we treated them for 21 days with doxycycline, and we use an oral gavage technique um, where we give it twice a day at 25 mg per kg. So this is a, um, 
a, a significant uh, dose of doxycycline. And fun fact, mice do not vomit. So when we give them oral gavage, we know that they retain the, the drug. And after one month of infection, then we euthanize the mice and collect their tissues for culture and PCR. And of course, um, during the treatment period, we collect extra amounts of blood so that we can monitor the, the doxycycline levels in the serum. So for all our mice, we had a 100% infection rate. They were all seropositive. Uh, we tested, like I said, we tested the antibiotic levels with um, an assay called the Kirby-Bauer, and then we collected culture data and PCR data. And so this is just a snapshot of what the data look like. This, this, this is hot off the press. It's not really publication ready, so I apologize for that. Um, but this, these are our different mice, and these are our different culture medias, and these are our controls here in the middle because this is the zone of inhibi inhibition for the antibiotic. So these mice did not get any antibiotic, and they were all culture positive, and uh, for the most part, or PCR positive. What's important is when we say that they grew in culture, these cultures were actively dividing, replicating Borrelia within one to two weeks of culture. So it's not, you know, 11 weeks out, multiple subcultures. This is legitimately growing um, Borrelia. And so here we have some mice that came up positive and here that were in our treated group. And we found that at the, at the trough levels that our antibiotic levels were at, at least at one microgram per mil, which is what's needed for the MIC. So to summarize the, the, the results, we were able to culture um, Borrelia from our untreated mice and from about 22% of our antibiotic-treated mice. So here are our different culture medias. And this is um, MKP media plus C is the carbohydrate source, the rich carbohydrate source, um, BSK with carbohydrates, and BSK plus agar. So you can see that in MKP plus C and B BSK plus C, we got 27 to 30% of our cultures to come up positive. And, um, Obviously, you compare this back to BSK, where zero uh, were positive, which is what we would expect. Um, and then we had tested them all by PCR, and we had anywhere between 44 and 73 percent, which were positive by PCR. So the percent of PCR positive culture negative, we want this to be as low as possible because we want all the PCR data to correlate with the culture data. Um, so. Obviously, none of them grew out in culture here, but they were PCR positive. And we got the best result here with the MKP plus C, and we actually had one that was culture positive and PCR negative. It could just be the luck of the draw when you're collecting the tissues and culturing them. Um, and then these are our, our untreated controls that were all 100% positive. So the uh, cultures from the antibiotic treated mice grew in those three different media and importantly, none grew from the BSK, and our serum levels were consistent uh, with, with the mice. There, was no, there were no uh, outliers where a mouse didn't have antibiotic levels, and that's why it regrew, which is a very important uh, aspect of this. So then we went back and revisited the spent media, and um, we have some ongoing experiments with uh, Dr. Ying Zhang, um, and so we're starting to add these, the, this enriched media to try to culture in our, in our um, antibiotic treatment efficacy studies. And so here's one where we have uh, four mice that went to necropsy after being treated with cefiroxime and one uh, group of mice that were treated with a triple combination. And you can see here with the black pluses these are the ones that were positive by culture using BSKH. And when we added the spent plus BSK and carb media, which is a mixture of the spent plus the enriched media, all of the, almost all of the um, tissues came up positive. So going forward, I think that we're going to start adding this to our culture medias to improve our recovery. So in conclusion, what we found was that the co-culture and use of spent media did not improve um, recovery of the Borrelia treated in vitro. 
However, um, the addition of agarose, chitobios, or a combination of carbohydrates resulted in the growth of Borrelia from 20 to 30 percent of doxycycline treated mice. And the addition of the carbohydrate sources and the spent media will be applied to future studies um, when measuring or evaluating treatment efficacy. So with that, um, I'd like to thank the, the Cohen Foundation and the members of my laboratory. I stand in the back, way back here, because I don't do anything. They do all the important stuff. I just, I just think of experiments. Um, and I'd like to thank my collaborators, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang from Hopkins, uh, Dr. Baumgarth from UC Davis, and Dr. Hazek from UC Davis. And um, I hope that you all have a tick cake at your next birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.